So why don't we get ready uh, to sit for about 10 minutes and then uh, begin our discussion of, of tracefulness. Mm -hmm. So just taking this time to allow ourselves to, to arrive. To be here in the body. And to really invite our whole selves to be here this evening. No part left out. And we can just take this time to connect with whatever gentle aspiration we have for ourselves. to be open to learning, to explore the path of awakening. To get support from each other and to give support to each other. And each of us in our own way can just take refuge in the Buddha, in the possibility of waking up in this lifetime to how things are. Taking refuge in the Dharma, the vast teachings on wisdom and compassion And in Sangha, the community of beings walking the path together, awakening together. And we're awakening to how things are in this time and place, how things are in our hearts, And as much as we can, we inhabit our bodies. Bringing as much ease and friendliness to that process as we can. Being in the body in a kindly and relaxed way as much as is possible.
So thanks everyone for being here. Um, before we get started on the parami um, of truthfulness, did anyone want to say anything in response to how practicing with patients went this past week? I know I, for one, was acutely aware of my impatience at, at times. Anything in particular that was noteworthy? I did have, I was paying attention to um, inpatients and phone calls, business, you know, when you're on with the, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I noticed there's like uh, ir irritation and then I blame, like a, it's like some, something the other person's doing. And one of the things I always benefit, I always say thank you when people are patient with me and here I am going around like, so I, um, I caught that and in several, I, I see it a lot too, many, m several times during the week, I caught it and actually turned it around. I breathed and then I just started kind of chit chat and I'm like, you know, where am I going? Like, mm -hmm. big deal. And um, I had lovely conversations <laughs> with these people. We ended up having really, you know, just pleasant. Um, so I appreciated that. Because I was aware of that, but I hadn't worked with it intentionally. Mm -hmm. in so um, I think it, it had a benefit. Thanks. I'm going to keep that up, by the way. <laughs> oh, good. Anyone else want to say anything about Practicing with patients. Yeah, this has been a challenging week. It's funny when you, when a person set, puts that intention out there, and then how the universe throws all kinds of earth homework at a person. Um, I and we already had it to be. I say we, my partner and I, because we've been um, looking for renters for next door in a, in, in a duplex that we live in. And that in itself during the COVID-19 is an extraordinary time to be even trying doing something like that. Mm -hmm. And then to try and have patience. Well, let's, let's put it this way. I, I was very aware when I was impatient, which was a lot of times, <laughs> um, and found it to be very, stress, very stressful doing this. But the other day I kind of had a little bit of a breakthrough and this was um, the other day when Kamala Masters and, and Steve Armstrong spoke. Um, and what, what Kamala kind of, uh, I'm not quoting perfectly, but what I love, we were discussing, she was, they were discussing compassion. Mm -hmm. And uh, she says, you know, she says, I just like to keep it really simple. It, when it, it was in, in, in terms of practicing the Brahma Viharas, because I've been doing met, the metta and I have multiple different phrases. But then she said compassion. And she says, I use this simple phrase, something to the effect of, may my heart be open to this. Mm -hmm. And that's all she said. And I thought, oh yeah. And then I tried it. Uh, and I could try it all over the place because there's so much going on, not just with us, but on this planet. And I, and I, I somehow I felt like there was a, a sense of spaciousness or space when I was, when I did that, uh, when I practiced that in many different venues. Um, 
And that helped to release some of my impatience. I still have that impatience there. Uh, but that really helped. I think uh, combining compassion with patience, that practice, I found very helpful. Thank you. And, you know, and even that, <clears throat> that phrase about an open heart, I, mean, I, I noticed in my inpatient times this week that I would, I just noticed that sense of constriction um, about feeling I need to get this done, um, you know, wanting someone else to speed thing and just watching that that kind of constriction and I think maybe remembering a phrase like can I just be here with an open heart can I open my heart and just the reminder <clears throat> the reminder to open I think would be a useful way of of working with um, with patients so thank you for suggesting that so our parami uh, today is truthfulness, and in Pali it's sacha, S-A-C-C-A, and it's truthfulness, and it has the elements of trustworthiness, sincerity, and honesty. And um, in my reading about this parami, uh, I came across a comment by uh, Joseph Goldstein, who said that truthfulness is the antidote to self-delusion. Truthfulness is the antidote to self-delusion. And <clears throat> the query is sort of, are we really seeing, first of all, seeing ourselves truthfully? Before we sort of move on to truthfulness in speech, with ourselves, are we seeing ourselves truthfully? Um, do we see our unwholesome qualities and tendencies? And do we also see our wholesome qualities and tendencies? And I know that both Nancy and, and Carol have been part of this um, weekday um, Dharma presentation that Steve and Kamala have been doing. And Steve has been talking a lot in the past couple of days about how you know, we shouldn't be wedded to an idea of our, you know, I'm an aversive type or, um, you know, that, that we, we sort of congeal around sometimes or identify with what is unwholesome um, and to see those as kind of states that arise and, and pass away. But it is really important to be aware of those, uh, whatever our unwholesome tendencies are. Do we see ourselves um, truthfully? And um, for me, it's, it's always been saying, you know, do I have a kind of story about myself? And one of the stories I would sometimes tell myself is, oh, poor me, why do I always have to be the responsible one? You know, why am I always the adult in this, in this situation? You know, it was this sort of pitying, self-pitying, poor me. And I would just watch that come up. And it was uh, not truthful, not helpful, but something that I had uh, actually fed quite a bit. And, and that would kind of come up, you know, just in meditation. I would be meditating and then I would have a thought about kind of how put upon I was. And just to, to see that was, was really, really helpful to see that, that it wasn't true. And it was a story that I had sort of identified with. It's also really important um, to see when our story about ourselves is a story of unworthiness. And Tara Brock is probably the, the um, teacher who uh, has probably talked about this and, and written about it most exhaustively. She talks about that sort of trance of unworthiness. 
Um, but um, Joseph says, for example, seeing we need to see unworthiness as a wrong view of self. To see this as wrong view if we consider ourselves unworthy. And just to notice that that's kind of a defilement, that, that unworthiness, this, this sense of unworthiness, this idea of unworthiness, that's a wrong view of ourselves. And so I, I think that's a, a very um, helpful reminder. And I think particularly in, um, in a culture that is very um, perfectionistic, that is very critical, that is very um, comparative, always judging, always judging, always judging. Um, and we're sort of, uh, if we're not the absolute best, we're not good enough. I mean, that seems to be a sort of, of theme often. And to really get that that is, that is a wrong view, if that's the view we have of ourselves. If we're, um, if we're not the best, we're not good enough, we're not worthy. And so, uh, looking at this parami, that this first part is really to um, look with that open heart that Carol mentioned. You know, at what, are, what are the views that we have of ourselves? The opinions, the, and, and just be aware of them. And, um, you know, some of them we may be able to hold more lightly than others and to realize their impermanent nature too. And, um, and to really bring some attention to recognizing our good qualities, our strengths. And that's, um, that's not something that we often do. I mean, I remember when I was, a, a, I think I was probably about nine years old, I asked my mother, I was one of four children, I was one of the middle children. Um, I asked my mother what my best quality was. And I really expected her to say that I was very smart. But she said, Patrice, I think you are a generous person. And I can't tell you how that really formed me in a way as, as a kid, that I really took that to heart. And um, because my mother was an extremely, I thought, intelligent, perceptive person, and I would never have said that about myself. But growing up, I thought of myself as a generous person. And I've always remembered that about how important it is, you know, with children to um, note their good qualities, um, to note their kindliness. And, and I just remember that has really had um, an important effect on my life that my mother told me that I was a generous, a generous person. So I, I think that it's, it's useful for us to uh, pay attention to um, those qualities that are, those good qualities that are strongest in ourselves and really um, appreciate them. Um, and, um, you know, and if we have some sort of attachment to a view of ourselves, um, to really look at that and uh, through, with this light of, of truthfulness and, and see what that attachment is, uh, is about. And it might very well be a kind of a wrong view that almost any time we have a really you know, fixed idea about something it is very likely to be a wrong view. So that's where we begin in talking about uh, truthfulness. Um, and this, uh, can also help bring us to an investigation where we try to understand the conditioned natures of our mind, our view of self and others. And what's been talked about a lot in the past couple of years has been this idea of um, implicit bias, where we have these uh, generalized attitudes about race, gender, size, class, ethnicity, 
religion, geography, where we just have this, this sort of um, attitude. And it's a matter of our conditioning, a matter of our experiences, and to just um, try to bring those forward into our, our consciousness. Um, you know, and, and I would also just encourage anyone who is interested in investigating this more to do the implicit association test that um, is available through Harvard. Um, but before you do that, I would also really encourage you to listen to a podcast that was on the hidden brain about two weeks ago. And it really talks, and I think the word, oh, um, how differences matter, I think is the title, but it was about two weeks ago. And it really talks about how um, the implicit association test came in, into being and what its uses are and some of the criticisms of it that it's not adequate to change our minds. But it was a very, very even handed discussion of the implicit association test. And I think it's a really good thing to listen to before you take, before you, you actually do the test. And I've taken it a couple of times for different issues like around homelessness, around race and um, uh, gender issues. But, you know, sort of understanding some of our own um, biases, our own attitudes that um, because they're so amorphous and general in our, uh, in our minds are not always really um, consciousness. So we can make an effort to, uh, to become aware of our implicit biases, to let them go, to recondition. And I heard of an interesting effort that, that some person, a woman, who said that she had always feared adult black men that if she saw an adult black man, uh, she just had this kind of natural um, shrinking. And she said, so her practice was every time she saw an adult black man, she would say to herself, wise and kind, wise and kind. And, um, you know, you could do that with homeless persons, any, you know, you, you sort of recondition your mind. And it's not something that works permanently. I, I remember reading about someone um, who had as their screensaver, a woman in a hard hat breastfeeding a child. And that was what they, um, they used to, to sort of remind themselves to uh, let go of um, the, the sort of narrow thinking and, and biases. So we can, you know, we can really work with something like that in, in the sense of having a more truthful, more accurate, um, not only a perception of other people, but sort of just um, sorting out our own, our own minds so that, you know, we can eventually, our preferences can just be preferences. You know, the kind of ice cream you like, the kind of food you like, the kind of music you like, that we can have preferences and they're just preferences. They're not these, these sorts of, of biases that make us judge one thing superior um, to another. And a really good example, what for me was a tremendous example in learning about this was years ago when I, I worked in the arts and, and was writing a lot of uh, criticism. And um, I uh, had a friend who was a poet, J. Otis Powell, uh, the late J. Otis Powell. And he would give me his poems and they just have everything in them. Uh, lots of metaphors, lots of images. And um, I would always think, you know, you take one, you have one metaphor, one image, kind of the, the dominant uh, motif, and then you have little variations. And I, you know, in painting, there's the foreground, there's the background. And I was looking at, uh, and, and Jay was always saying to me, but it's all in there. 
it's all in there. Everything belongs. And I was looking at some um, African American art, and there was so much going on, and and it wasn't you know foreground, middle ground, background, and it was lots of different color and the sort of polyrhythmic music. And I finally got this was an aesthetic of abundance. This was not an aesthetic of of ordering. It was not, you know, sort of the ballet with the, the prima ballerina and the, the dancer and then the core. It was not, you know, sort of a recreation of, of feudal Europe. But this was an aesthetic of abundance. And so much uh, African-American work was that way that it was inclusive. Everything belonged. And it was just a different aesthetic. And you know, it really changed, it, you know, great blew my mind to realize, oh, this is just a different aesthetic. And once I got that, I could really, really appreciate the work. But I had this, this bias um, that was pretty unconscious to me about, you know, what a poem, how a poem should be, how a painting should be. And it was, you know, also, you know, the sort of Aristotelian, you know, beginning, middle, end. Um, and it, it was just, it was so freeing. I guess that's what I want to say. You know, when we can, can see these biases in ourselves, it is such a taste of freedom. And first it's, first it's horrible, right? First it's, it's shocking. But then when we can let go of that, when we can kind of break through that, when, we, when that, that comes up and we can just see it for what it is, it is such a taste of freedom. So this is, uh, you know, part of this idea about about truthfulness is first of all just working with with our own minds, and um, and really having you know, all of the other virtues we, we've talked about, um, bringing that to the investigation of our own minds, um, and uh, and just being able to hang in there till we can have this sort of truthful. Um, uh, sense of of uh, of ourselves in a way, and then the arena that we are probably more familiar in working in truthfulness, and that is in in speech. And the Buddha's guidelines on speech are: um, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it timely and is it offered without ill will? And last week, Carol said, no, for the one, is it timely? Like, what's the context in which we're speaking? So is it, is it true? Is it helpful? And, and another way of saying that is, does this need to be said? Does this need to be said? What's the context in which we're saying it? And can it be said without ill will? And you know, we might not always be able to, um, to sort of meet all those four conditions, but it really helps us to be aware of that. It really helps us if we can, um, first of all, um, pay attention to the truthfulness of things. And you know, there, there is such a temptation to pass on information that reinforces our own, um, our own position, our own likes, our own dislikes. Um, and uh, and there's it's just it's so easy now to just um, copy a link and and send it or respond. I mean, I think that, and this is not news to anyone that the sort of um, the ease of the internet has made it really possible for all of us to engage in a kind of 
hasty end and thoughtless speech. Uh, I mean, I, I find that that's, uh, that's a real, um, it's just so easy to do that. So to really, really pay attention to is something truthful. Does it need to be said? That question of, is it helpful? Is it helpful speech? Is it timely? What's the context for it? Uh, and finally, are we offering it without ill will? And you know, when we sort of mess up in our speech, are we willing to uh, sort of make an amends? Are we willing to, uh, to repair? Because the benefit of being truthful, the benefit to each of us is that the more truthful we are, the more trustworthy we are, the more people will, uh, will trust us. Um, many years ago when I was a, uh, my first faculty job, um, I said some very intemperate things at my first faculty senate meeting or something, faculty meeting, and um, feeling very righteous and very feminist. And, um, and someone that I had only met came up to me afterwards and said, you know, if you continue to say things like another woman, he said, you know, he said, I understand that what you said was true, but if you continue to say things like that in the faculty senate, you will be dead in the water or something to that effect. And I thought immediately, this person is going to be my best friend because this person was really telling me the truth about how to, um, how to sort of make my way in this, um, in this context. And, and I, I think it, it's kind of hard to tell someone something that's difficult about their behavior. Like you made a really big mistake by asking that question or saying, saying that thing. Um, and uh, so I really felt that this person had risked something by saying this truthful thing to me that was in my own best interest. And I just knew that we were going to be really, really, really good friends because of that. And we were. Um, she just died very unexpectedly last fall, but we were, uh, even after I stopped teaching, we would meet once a year at a B&B &B and uh, hang out for a weekend. And we did that for more than 30 years. So, you know, it's just, you know, when someone tells you the truth, you can really trust them. And, uh, you know, that is such, um, being trustworthy is such a beautiful thing because people, people will know that you will tell them the truth. You are worthy of their trust. You won't dissemble, you know, and you may say difficult things in a very kind and compassionate way, which would be, be a very good way to say things. But you know, that, that idea about telling, uh, telling the truth makes you a trustworthy person. And that really provides the grounds for intimacy. You know, when people, we feel that we can trust people, we can be really intimate and vulnerable with them, and they can be intimate and vulnerable with us. So I think this is, you know, a life, a life work to, um, to really develop this quality of, um, of truthfulness. Um, and, um, and it, it's, uh, it's a great strength. It really is a strength these days to be able to, um, to speak truthfully, to say something that needs to be said, to say it in the appropriate context, and to do it without ill will. So I'd be delighted to hear some of your responses or examples or how you've been working with this.
and just unmute yourself and jump in. Yeah, hi Patrice. Yes. Um, I was in um, one of Nancy's yoga classes the other day, and she usually gives you know a short talk, you know something about the Dharma as an introduction, and and she was talking about you know we don't go from delusion to being awake; that you go from you know being deluded to being confu confused, confused. <clears throat> And I'm, right now I'm deep, deep in this confused state. <clears throat> and um, I could see, you know, how I've been deluded, but I'm not really getting a clear picture of things. And it's just very difficult, you know, especially with relationships I've had with people all my life, where it's just, it's just difficult, you know, to maintain friendships, you know, deep friendships with people I've known without uh, annoying them, <laughs> you know? And I, I, that's just, just my comment is the truthfulness. I understand this, but um, you know, and, and the teachings at Common Ground, especially, you know, um, like the series you've been doing is wonderful. And by listening to different teachers, I can kind of, um, you know, different, get different viewpoints. So, I mean, right now, I feel kind of like, um, like anytime you try and learn a skilled activity, you know, in music or art or writing, a, you know, whatever it is, paddling a kayak, uh, you go, the first part of it is always, you know, the technical aspects of it, you know, being able to play scales and arpeggios and takes quite a while before you can produce anything that looks like music and you just kind of have to suffer, suffer with it. And the people that listen to you have to suffer with you too, you know, until you can get it. And, uh, so, um, so I'm really struggling with that truthfulness right now. You know, what, you know, I, I can't really judge what, I don't know what's true and what's, not true just because my viewpoints are, are switching and I'm seeing so many different sides to things right now, especially, you know, with this unrest, you know, that we're going through this, this change. You know, I, I think the, the, it sounds to me like the, the truthful thing is to be where you are in this place of not knowing, not being sure, um, I mentioned, um, I think when we started out that I'd, I'd had this, um, my mantra for the year was supposed to be, you know, make space for not knowing, it was one of the things that I was going to really try to practice myself, make space for not knowing about not always having to have an opinion right away, of needing to understand right away, because my own uh, MO is sort of to have an opinion pretty quickly, um, to try to master the material very quickly. Um, and I'm really trying to make, in my own practice, more space for not knowing. Mm -hmm. So with some of the issues that have um, come up recently, um, like um, you know, around uh, defund the police, I'm really willing just to be kind of open about that and not need to have a real opinion about what should be done, but to really be open to an investigation. And that's probably the most truthful thing I can say is I don't know what, what should be done. I know something should be done, but I don't know what, and I'm really open. So I, I think that, I don't know if this gets at what you're, you're saying, Kevin, but this idea of be, about being really honest when we don't know, that's a, I think, a, an important um, point to just be really honest 
when we don't know and when we we you know we don't have an opinion or we don't we don't know enough to have an opinion um so and i think also that um there is something in the way in which um a lot of interaction takes place that stays on a very superficial level and that when we bring more sincerity and um, and sort of uh, wanting to wanting to be more deeper, more vulnerable, more uh, more truthful, more intimate, that um, many people will just want to back off. You know, um, they'll say things like, "Oh no, now she's going to get serious on this. Now she's going to get all serious about this." Or um, you know, there are sometimes in in social situations where wanting to really have a deeper conversation. Um, you know, you'll just be with people who are not willing to go there, that who want to keep things at a very um, official, pleasant social level. And okay, and that's that's the way it is in that moment. But I think, um, and and this is a generalization, um, but I think especially for men, men talking with men, I think that is is hard sometimes when um, uh, based on um, my partner's experience or and watching um, sometimes I, I think it's um, it's hard maybe harder for men to have intimate conversations among themselves than for women to have those conversations with men or women to have them with with other other women and I think that's part of just that socialization about, um, you know, sort of um, not being vulnerable. A um, number of things you've said have, have touched me. I, I, the first thing, I'm talking about men, um, I think what you said is, is, is um, there's a lot in it about men finding it difficult to, to talk um, intimately, but I have had experiences in men's groups where it's happened. So it's one of those things that's not not an absolute, but just there's a tendency for men to find it more difficult. But I I know that in, in my men's group, it's been extremely intimate with men men talking of, about feelings with each other. Um, the thing I was intending to say was one idea came this week with we were we were with uh, uh, friends like a socially distant um, dinner and a friend talked about having different churches at this time and I really liked that idea in terms of like that's how I'm feeling at the moment because um, as as you've been saying Patrice about not knowing there's a lot of that that I have and um you know, this idea of being able to take from different churches, as it were. Um, one thing I read this yesterday, I think, about Gandhi's idea of um, experiments in truth. And so this life is a series of experiments in truth, which mm -hmm. I really related to, um, because I've had a lot of that. And, and some experiments don't work, and others do. And I really, really love that. Um, and there was another quote, quote I, that touched me when I read today from Thomas Merton talking about um, so many people live lives of, of impersonation, self-impersonation, not being true to themselves. And, um, you know, and, and I do understand that because when I wear the hat that I wear in, in my professional life, um, I don't, I, go, I, I have a different name even. In my professional life, I'm I'm Terence in my professional life, and Garish in my personal life, and I'm comfortable with it um, because in my professional life, I don't really want to. Um, is it this, as as you said about, is it true, helpful, timely? In my professional life, sometimes it wouldn't be helpful or timely, or um, it would be true. I, if I talked about my past 
experiences, but people would be completely shocked about what I've experienced in my life. Um, and that wouldn't be helpful at all. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a dance in a way of, of like, well, w which, which ballroom are you in? Um, that's where <laughs> a metaphor I can be comfortable with with it. Um, am I in, in you know, um, the Sufi work that it done where it just can be free, free movement? or whether I'm in a ballroom situation doing the waltz. Um, not that I can do the waltz very well. But um, yeah, so I, there's a lot that's, uh, that's going on with that. But I really like the idea of the different, this not knowing one thing is the, the, the continual search and, and being able to, um, to, to expand my, my horizons in a lot of ways. And I've been reading White Fragility today, and I've been reading um, uh, Just Mercy, you know, just to also to try and understand a lot more about the issues of our time. That's all, thanks. Thanks, Garish. Okay, um, I'd like to say that um, my understanding of, or my understanding of truth has um, quite a lot to do with wisdom and um, to know to, to be in one's own truth um, and to be aware that there are so many different takes on things and so someone else's truth is going to also be different from mine. We may come to agreements about things, but my experience is going to be my own. And um, I think that with truth, you, you also mentioned trust. And I think that um, it's also very cultural. Um, and it's surprising that, you know, my husband who is British and I speak the same language, but culturally we're constantly having to clarify what it is that is implied or inferred or what we understand of each other or what it is because the cultural differences are very profound, even though we're speaking the same language. And I think that um, when, when we start to look at um, the cultural differences between me being a, a native New Yorker and coming to the Midwest, coming to the Twin Cities, that the cultural differences there are also huge and we're all Americans. So it, it's very, um, I think that, that what's happening here, the um, uprising, the explosion of um, awareness and, 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 and violence that is around racism, and then also trying to deal with COVID, has completely um, uh, changed our reality. And so being truthful is um, really interesting because the not knowing is something that is one of the most difficult things to sit with, to be with in oneself and in having a sense of trust in how things are going to unfold and we really don't know. And so um, the truthfulness, as you were saying too, and I make this gesture because I was a dancer and I still sometimes struggle with finding the words, but to articulate what you were talking and pointing to, Patrice, I think that you're saying too, like, you know, we get fixed in our biases but we, we get fixed in wanting to be, wanting things to be recognizable, wanting things to be easily identified, 
wanting things to be, I mean, in a, in a very large picture. And so to be truthful is maybe to come back to our own self, you know, in a way, our heart, how brokenhearted we might each of us be. And how uncertain that is. And, 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 and realizing that here in this group, we are so, um, I'm so grateful, <laughs> you know, to be able to come to different platforms, different churches, different gatherings, to be able somehow to honestly process what's going on within a context and a framework that is spiritual. So, you know, I guess that's my piece, but I, you know, I, I, I want to thank you, but I, I, I think that there's a lot of wisdom here in the group itself, you know, for, for being able to talk about this from a place that's real. And I think our, our mindfulness, I mean, our mindfulness practice really supports us in this as we um, you know, as we have all spent time, you know, just sitting with our own, our own minds and just investigating the territory of the heart and the mind over and over and over again. And, um, you know, I, I think that, that that really prepares us for these difficult um, more public, more social, more interpersonal uh, conversations and explorations and investigations. That 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 time that we spend, um, you know, just learning about the terrain of of the heart and and the mind, and as Carol said earlier, you know, and then you know, having this intention about keeping the heart open. Um, you know, that really is sort of the, the rudder that will um, help us navigate this really um, tremendously um, uh, volatile time. So, it's after seven. Uh, does anyone have any last words they'd like to, to say briefly before we we end for tonight? Well, I really um, appreciate, as always, you're all being here. It just feels great to investigate these uh, paramis together. And um, I hope we'll be here next week. So have a good night.